Welcome to Exxon News TV. I'm Mark Asala. On May 12, 2014, researchers using Google Maps discovered what appeared to be a huge undersea entrance to the U.S. landmass nearly seven miles off the coast of Malibu. The size of the overall structure is massive. The plateau over the entrance is approximately 1.4 miles by 2.5 miles wide and is 500 feet thick. The undersea entrance is about 2,700 feet wide and 630 feet tall. The top of the structure is 1,500 feet below the ocean surface and the bottom is about 2,300 feet deep. The undersea entrance's size and location rule out construction by the US military or corporation which has not been witnessed during any major engineering project in the area which hosts Malibu's most exclusive homes. The structure appeared to be very old. This suggests the original builders were either an ancient civilization or aliens. The undersea entrance appeared to still be in good condition suggesting it was still active. Who would be using it and where does it lead? Numerous sightings and photographs of UFOs off the coast of Malibu has for decades fueled speculation of an undersea base used by alien visitors. Extraterrestrial civilizations visiting our planet could certainly possess the technology to build and maintain such a massive facility. There is, however, another, more likely possibility, a classified space fleet operated by US Space Command. There has long been stories that portions of California and Nevada sit on a shelf underneath which lies the Pacific Ocean. This would make it possible for large undersea objects to travel inland to military facilities without being sighted. According to the whistleblower testimonies, the US Navy and Air Force possess aircraft carrier sized space vehicles using anti-gravity propulsion capable of deep space travel. Such large vehicles would need a place where they could be docked for periodic service and for construction. The massive underwater entrance is big enough for such large vehicles to enter and secretly travel to classified facilities for servicing. Are there any Navy and Air Force facilities that could service anti-gravity space vehicles in the vicinity of the undersea entrance? The most likely Air Force facility is Edwards Air Force Base, which is roughly 90 miles from the entrance. Edwards Air Force Base has large aerospace companies such as Lockheed Martin located nearby that could secretly work on the construction or repair of a secret space fleet. Ben Rich, the legendary head of Lockheed Skunk Works Division, boasted to an audience that, quote, we have the technology to take ET home. The closest naval location is the Naval Air Weapons Station at China Lake, California, approximately 140 miles inland. China Lake is over 1 million acres in size. It is the Navy's biggest landholding site in the US. The Navy's anti-gravity fleet is likely developed and hosted at China Lake. The legendary scientist Vannevar Bush, who led the US federal government's initial studies of UFOs, was a leader in the creation of China Lake for scientific research and development. Bush led massive scientific military engineering projects such as the Manhattan Project. He likely helped the Navy develop China Lake for engineering large anti-gravity space vehicles. US Space Command's biggest secret has likely just been discovered, the undersea entrance used by its classified space fleet. And we welcome you to Off Planet Radio Live on a Friday night, November the 21st, 2014. The subject of our interview tonight is kind of nutshelled in that uh, commentary by Michael Sala from XO News. We're going to be talking with our guest tonight, uh, Robert Stanley, and we're going to discuss the megaliths at Malibu and um, ongoing things underneath the earth, under the sea, in the skies, and what it means for existence on planet earth as we deal with, with what is obviously alien intrusion and alien consciousness into the human sphere of activity. And so we welcome tonight our guest returning, Robert Stanley from UnicusMagazine.com. Good evening and welcome. Randy, nice to be with you again. It's good to have you. Is the mic a little better now? My um, yeah. Yes. Okay. We were over-modulating. And uh, welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Robert. Um, tonight we're going to kind of, I guess, kind of slip in sideways where we left off in our previous interview where you uh, generously shared your own experiences in Malibu, um, your experiences in, in, a, in a mountaintop experience that you had. But tonight we're going to focus, at least at the beginning of this interview, on the Malibu megaliths that you discovered and have publicized on your website. 
Okay, great. Well, you know, since you played that clip from Michael Sala, I got to tell you, it, as he was talking about China Dry Lake, I was having a flashback of being outside the range in a mountain, uh, the Sierra Nevadas, um, one night. I was camped there with a friend. We were preparing to go into a cave system the next morning, and um, there were incredibly powerful, silent blue beams of light being projected from the base all the way out into space. Um, it was it was pretty much the middle of the night. Nobody around, at least not where we were, because we were up in a wilderness area. And um, as that was occurring some sort of craft it was definitely not conventional because it was completely silent it came out of the west towards the base and it passed roughly overhead um not too far overhead i mean maybe i don't know a couple thousand feet and what was really extraordinary about it was uh not only that it was there and it was making no noise whatsoever but it was glowing entirely enveloped in some sort of plasma and as it passed through the atmosphere um the air was ionized behind it mm. so it left a trail of very faint light as it moved through the night sky i mean it just I, it just gives me the chills just thinking about it again because i was thinking holy god what is going on out here and that was back in the 80s back when i was having close encounters in malibu um i uh, you know, I for whatever reason, I was up there with a friend, and we, you know, we, uh, well, hey, I, I, I can't say what happens there, but we do know for sure that um, that the aquifer does extend all the way out to the Mojave. Uh, for example, like uh, Death Valley. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a there's a, a place where people go diving, and uh, it seems to shift with the tides, with the ocean tides, and it's very far inland. So um, anyway, yeah, that, uh, those, that those plasma discharges and negative ions are part of uh, a lot of people's witness about um, encounters with UFOs and, and strange phenomena. Yeah, uh, I've heard that continuously over the years. Uh, what yeah. I heard Michael Sala say there, and I had to, I had to kind of you know, smile, is that he talked about the military or the corporation. Um, kind of a very cloaked statement that he made there about the fact that our government is uh, basically corporately involved with projects um, to sure. various. He mentioned um, uh, the skunk works at Lockheed Martin and yep. the disclosures that have come out there. I mean, we've been operating in this mode for um well, since 1947, the National Security Act and what Dwight Eisenhower later called the military-industrial complex, mm -hmm. which is, all seems to be connected to um, this rapid explosion of technology and phenomena that have occurred since, you know, World War II, certainly. Yeah. Your own background began and was outlined in the previous interview that we did and of course the the interviews you've done on coast to coast and many other radio stations and we don't need to revisit that but it's it's all seems to begin with malibu and it seems right. that what you've identified as the malibu megaliths when we begin to look at it, it has these um echoes of other sites across the planet that have been mysteries. And I, I sent you that uh, mm -hmm. that graphic from Peter Moon's book, Transylvania, Transylvanian Sunrise, which has a very similar sphinx-like megalith that was found in the Bekechi Mountains of Romania and is detailed in the book Transylvanian Sunrise, which has to do with the underground chambers that were clearly erected by uh, an off-world intelligence. So. Yeah. Begin where you want to in the narrative about Malibu megaliths and what it means in terms of where we're going in this discovery about the Archons. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it's taken me 29 years to have any conclusive answers to share with anybody. I mean, it's it's like if you look at the website now, I, I mean, it's shocking to me because it's what I've wanted to do. I don't know why it's taken me this long for whatever reason. Um, uh, it, it, okay, let's just put it this way. It wasn't the easiest thing for me to do. I don't mean the website, but uh, unraveling this Gordian knot 
that is our history, mm-hmm. it's it's really obvious to me that we've been lied to for a long time. And, um, you know, I, here's here's the bottom line from what I, where I'm just, just sitting right now. Uh, we're in the midst of a civil war, a cosmic civil war. Yes. And and this planet is under the uh, currently under the control of um, the dark side. The Luciferian agenda is very real. Uh, he and his um, followers have illegitimately taken control of this planet and turned it in from a paradise planet into a prison planet. So, um, you know, the, the, the information that I have, it's, it's like, it's just a stepping stone. The, the monuments there, in my estimation at this point, is that they were uh, created by Lucifer's brother, Enlil, Lucifer is also known as Enki in the mm-hmm. Sumerian mm-hmm. stuff. So in any case, um, uh, en- Enlil and his mother are the ones that actually f- created this, this garden paradise. It was originally called Tiamat or Gaia. And, um, of course, it was called Earth after mm-hmm. Lucifer took it over uh, and crowned himself, again, Ill- illegitimately crowned himself Lord of the World. He's, he's also the Lord of the Archons. You know, and, and that's... I guess that was the harder part for me was to to get the sequence right, so that I could help 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 people walk through this, um, because that's how it started for me was being attacked by these what looked like etheric parasites, and um, that's what led me to the mountain that night, uh, September twenty first, nineteen eighty five, and that's how I met a being of light, or I should say a radiant being who was very. You know, he was in, we were, it was, it was just bizarre. Okay. I still think of it as just, you know, strange to say the least, but I do believe now after 29 years, uh, I finally can say with some certainty that that was Enlil. Uh, Cause there's no way that my fa- he said he was my father. Okay. Which, you know, that part is very curious to me still. I, I think I know my biological father, but it's, I think what he meant, this being of light Enlil, Prince Enlil actually of Orion when he when he was addressing me, I think he meant that in a more uh, eternal sense. You know that we are family, uh, part of the same soul group, uh, because I have the same characteristics as he does. Certainly, don't have the same characteristics as Lucifer, his brother, his older brother. Um, and I, I, I just got to add this too: um, the reason Lucifer was passed over for kingship of the Orion empires because because he was behaving like a psychopath and he still is and what the reason i mention that is because i believe that is a, according to what i read in a book uh, a friend of the family wrote this book uh, his name's norman paulson he wrote a book called well it was originally called uh, sunburst return of the ancients um it's now called christ consciousness you can still get it and it's a, the middle part of it is very fascinating as far as the historical uh, timeline. He he puts together there about, uh, you know, these two brothers fighting. And, and he says that um, Lucifer and, a, you know, a group of other Anunnaki had gone, foolishly gone into a forbidden zone. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and when they went in there, they, they came out and they had gone crazy. Um, and when I... I, look, I'd, I'd read that a bunch of times, and it was only after 2011 when I asked my father. I, mentally, I, I connect with this him sometimes when I'm in really dire straits. And I mean, like I said, the night I was up on the mountain, I was in a very dire strait. I was in complete survival mode. I didn't know what these things were or why they were attacking me. Or, I mean, it was utter confusion for me. So um, <clears throat> I'm grateful that he would take the time to... Uh, messaged me long distance because I don't think he was actually there. I, my understanding is that they use uh, some sort of holographic projection. Right, right, yeah. You know, and yes, I was out of my body, but still, I mean, we were, we had some sort of communication. And um, anyway, um, part of it was in 2011, I, I really couldn't quite figure this out. I was just perplexed what what these parasites were. How does this all fit in the, in the narrative, you know, uh, and um, I guess I, I, you know, just to remind people because we're on a battlefield, the first casualty of war is always the truth, and that's why you know the, because the victors always write or rewrite history. This is one of the reasons that we're having such a hard time 
getting a straight answer. You know that old adage, the truth will set you free? Well, good luck trying to find it here on the well, battlefield. And, and your own journey is exactly emblematic of this quest that I think a lot of people are on, Robert. We're, we're sorting yeah. through... We're sorting through incomprehensible spans of time, not to mention space and dimension in well, dealing sure. with this. We're dealing with, with interdimensional beings who control time and to some degree control <laughs> space, even the very ground that we walk on. The, the, yeah. the, the, the New Testament describes Satan as the prince of the power of the air. And so we're, yeah. we're threading through ancient mythologies, all of which seem to be hopelessly broken in their narrative somewhere. And yeah. it's like all these details and these clues have to be welded and fused together and then shuffled and resorted a thousand times before we get a coherent picture. Yeah. But, but I get the sense that through kind of the collective efforts of, of people out there, and especially people like yourself, who have had experiences and been able to glean firsthand insight that we're a little closer now. We are very much so. And uh, uh, a lot of this has to do with this, uh, the quickening that took place between 1987 and 2012 when our planet actually aligned with the galactic center. And that did start to awaken or reawaken or reactivate some of our DNA. And I'm not talking about the strands talking about what most people call junk DNA. It's actually a, uh, a coded language. And mm -hmm. it yeah. is, uh, it's, it's the, you know, DNA is actually a fractal antenna, and it's how we connect between the physical and the non-physical realm of realities. So, um, you know, one of, the, one of the problems here is that uh, the history is not only broken, it was intentionally rewritten in a way that it made the victors look like heroes, and or uh, lords over mankind. They also switched things over. Lucifer and his group uh, switched things over from a matriarchal system to a patri patriarchal system and inserted himself as the lord over all. Um, and, and, and not only that, he, uh, in some regard, actually in a large measure, were all related to him because of the genetic manipulation or modifications that he and his wife performed here on this planet after they uh, essentially destroyed it and then took it over. And, um, you know, the problem is they actually consider us their property. That is a huge, huge problem uh, because, well, they don't want to let us go, obviously. And um, it makes it difficult for the benevolent ones to uh, intervene or even have contact with us. But isn't it even what Dutch uh, for? Um, what was the guy? Um, Charles Fort said he, yep. in one of his books, "We're property." Well, he he thought we were someone's property, yeah. and he was right. He was right. He just didn't have enough information. So th again, this is the thing about you know that old adage: "The truth shall set you free." But finding, look, even if somebody told you the truth, would you recognize it no. at this point? Because no. we've been so programmed uh, to believe lies. And to actually be uh, expecting a, someone to save us, to just give us all the answers. And that isn't, that isn't going to happen, in my yeah. estimation, of the, you know, the, of the situation. And um, we were never designed that way to begin with. I mean, we are intelligent beings with free will. And more importantly, we have the ability through our DNA to connect to the cosmic consciousness. And I believe that is coming. I believe that is why... One of the reasons I'm, I, I appreciate you having me on here, because I know this is going to sound far, extremely far-fetched to some people, but um, here's a term you, you may have may not have heard. It's called the super wave. Um, I only came across this term recently because I actually had a, uh, a uh, uh, like a remote viewing, I guess, of what was coming. Mm -hmm. That there, that our, everything kept pointing me back to DNA. You know, I wasn't a lot of times I'm not looking for these things and it's be, I, I feel like I'm being guided to it gently. Yeah. Nobody's nobody's pulling my strings. Right. Right. Uh, but the, yeah, and it's usually how the benevolent ones work. So uh, uh, what what I saw coming is a wave or a frequency uh, washing over the planet that will actually cause everybody's DNA to spontaneously become coherent and connect to the cosmos. What that means is in plain English 
everybody's going to wake up and suddenly see things for how they really are, and they'll have a knowing. And it's going to be, um, to say the least, shocking to most people. Uh, it will shatter their paradigm. It will cut right through the crap that they've been fed for so long. Even in, even if they're all drugged up and uh, you know shut down on some level, that, that you got to understand, our bodies are just an extension of an etheric blueprint. Right. That right, the spirit, yeah. the spirit body, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's. It, it precedes the physical. It, it is the blueprint for the for the uh, atoms to actually take that particular form, whatever it may be. Yeah, I mean, we call it the etheric body or the energy yeah. body. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I think I didn't finish something else. I got to okay. get it out there. What, well, about about Lucifer and his his the other people that were with him, the other Anunnaki that were with him when they ventured into that particular area of space, and then. According to Norm, what he was told by, the, you know, the benevolent beings he had contact with in the 50s, uh, they said that when, when Lucifer and the rest of them came out of that forbidden zone that they had gone mad and started attacking their own kind and destroying worlds. This apparently is, is why um, he, was, he was passed over or denied the kingship of Orion because he, you know, he was, he was gone mad. Um, other people say, well, it's because he was passed over for kingship that he went mad. W one of the ingredients that's missing in all this, and, and it was really strange, like I said, when I asked for clarity on this back in 2011, part of it was when I was reading Norm's book again for, I don't know, maybe fourth or fifth time in my life, since, well, since 1986 or whatever, um, I could see it like remote viewing. I could actually see what happened. It was that they... they um, uh, had picked up those parasites, those truly alien parasites. I, I think they might have actually gone through a wormhole or Stargate or whatever. And they went to a place that was completely incompatible with this universe. And they picked up a parasite and brought it in. And so th that is the beginning of the infection here. And I have, I think, correctly defined evil as an infection by this particular parasite. Now, because we know... Uh, from other life forms that have here on Earth that have been infected by parasites, that it utterly alters their behavior, and usually not for a good, not for good. And the, this is the most simple example I'll give, and I think it's it's accurate. Is that um, uh, a, a household dog is is very loving and very obedient, right? Mm -hmm. But if it gets rabies, right, it it is no longer obedient. And it even, you know, even if you love it, it is going to want to attack you. So um, because this had never been seen before in this universe, it has taken some time to figure out how to deal with it. And I, I've had quite a few people say to me, you know, well, what are the benevolence doing? About it? You know, what's taking them so long? Well, it's you, you, here's what you need to keep in mind is that they are more or less immortal. And um, the, it's not like they're lazy by any stretch of the imagination. It's, it's a very complicated situation, and they're, they're learning to adapt and um, come up with contingency plans. And like I said, this is part of it. Now, the reason that the, the super wave is going to occur, I believe, is because well, first of all, they want us to wake up. They want us to to be free because that's an our, uh, that was part of the original design of this experiment here on this world. Uh, I mean, everybody's got free will, but th this was this was a very unique um, jewel in the crown, as it were, of the Orion Empire. And um, w here's what here's what else you got to be prepared for is that disclosure is going to happen, but not like what people think. And what I see coming and i think that i've got I've, I've had a lot of confirmation once i saw this coming i was really shocked when i started finding uh corroborative information which is that the vatican is preparing for the return of the gods and so is the un and the two are going to work in concert to um reestablish it's going to look like they've just you know shown up and hey we're here to save you and in fact, it's nothing of the kind. It's it's a, the final act of deception that they are going to pull here on this planet. And um, to counter that, 
the benevolent ones are sending a wave, this wave of a frequency. It's a wave that will wash over the planet and wake everybody up pretty much all at once. And um, and from what, again, from what I was seeing is that because people have free will and it needs to be honored, there are quite a few people here that are going to uh, choose to continue down the path with the Archon. So, uh, again, it, just kind of delineate this for people. So we have a deception coming. It, it's always been here. Yeah. We've been deceived from the moment that they arrived. They started saying that they were things that they were not claiming that they were king and lord of the earth and all this stuff. Totally illegitimate, total lies. Uh, you know, made us feel guilty, you know, uh, with lies like, that. you know, basically making women out to be horrible when, in fact, they they know good <laughs> that women actually have the divine uh, gift of life. They're, they're much closer to the, uh, they have a much greater depth of creativity as far as bear, life bearing. And I don't just mean children. I'm talking about in, literally creating solar systems and Whoa. galaxies. Yeah, galaxies. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, like Mother Earth, Gaia. And th that's not a... <laughs> That's not just some fantasy. You know, the Gnostics called her Sophia, and that's where we get the words uh, sophistry or sophistication. Right. They right. make it, they make it, they try and make it sound like she was the one that created the Archons accidentally. Not true. Okay, I was going to ask you about that because yeah, that's actually part of all that we've been doing. Those Gnostic yeah. scriptures seem yep. to indicate that this is some kind of illicit. Uh, I believe the term is even used in the text, some sort of abortion in terms of a creation. So you disagree with that? In that I do. And here's, here's why. Here's why. We don't know what the Gnostic text really said. We've only got a scrap uh, that's attributed to them. There were thousands of scrolls in the libraries of Alexandria that were destroyed intentionally. Exactly. So, the, yep. so the archons would not be outed. I mean, why do you think they come? The, 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 archon, the archons just utterly genocided. The Gnostics and anybody else who had any hermetic uh, information or knowledge, you know, it's not permitted here. We are slaves. We are property. We're, we're not allowed to know these things because it makes it far more difficult to control us. So um, anyway, like I said, this is what's coming. This is I should say it's an ongoing conflict. I don't know that it's going to be fully resolved. But one of the things I was shown, as I said before, there are. A number of people here, I don't know what the percentage is now, but it, they're, the, the Luciferians are, are hoping that through this final act of deception of being here to save us is going to ensure that um, uh, the maximum number of people, souls here on this planet, will con choose willingly to continue on the path of darkness with the Archons. And... Um, you know, I, 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 so that's one of the reasons I've been talking about this. Now, I know most people are are simply not even interested in this. People who listen to your show are obviously are. So it's incumbent upon us when the opportunity comes up to have a discussion with people who are slightly interested. People who are, have no interest, you can't reach them, and you have to respect their free will, even though it is painful to see them go continue down this path. The parasitic path, because that's really what it is. Well, you know, there's a couple of factors here. One of them being that even though it, we're still kind of viewed as the the, the fringe, the, the the edges of of reality, this is bleeding into the public consciousness. Although, right. in some ways, I suspect there's a fair amount of disinformation to attempt to interrupt the awakening process, but. If you just look at what's on television, what's and there's some amazing things get revealed in literature, in film, in TV series, and in, in a lot of the books out there. So we see it bleeding out into the mainstream consciousness, at least the awareness that something is different, something is wrong. Mm -hmm. Then you have the off-the-rail psychopathy of the world leaders, the bankers, the politicians. I don't even need to go through the laundry list. We all know them real well. But there's... This is this is where it really does come into the archontic infection. Something yeah. has gotten a hold of our consciousness at such a, 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 a deep level that now we see the infection full blown. We see it in yep. the banking failures, the the wars, the turmoil that's going on. 
And I think this yeah. is the important point is that there is this this awakening. And the question is, is it a tipping point or is it this this super wave that comes in and just melts away this 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 blindness that we've been under? Well, again, that, that would just be uh, the peak of the battle, I guess. The final act, like I said, is going to be um, from a Christian perspective. People say, oh, it's revelation. OK, everything would be revealed. And as we awaken, then the judgment day comes. And, I, and what I mean by that is we have to exercise good judgment and, and choose wisely either to continue down the path with the archons or co- go back to the garden with the benevolent beings of light. That pre- sounds pretty simple, but honestly, some people are going to be totally conflicted. And I, I'm pretty sure there'll be a lot of people that physically will just drop dead. And they'll be sta- they'll literally be standing next to their body, wondering what happened, um, uh, because I mean it's just it's going to be such a shock, such a shock. So and after that, again from a Christian perspective, they would call that the new heaven and new earth, um, because it's it's a, it's a new beginning. It just is. It has to it has to reset. I don't even know if it's going to be here or how they're going to fix this planet. It, it's going to be difficult to redeem, and especially if. Because, you know, there's always the possibility that the uh, the Luciferians would simply just destroy this world, kill everybody. They, you know, they figure if if you're coming, if there's an outside force, their adversaries, okay, come in, the benevolent ones come in here and try and liberate us. They consider that an act of, of, of a further act of war and, and theft. So um, it's it's not a pretty picture, I'll tell you. It's, it's really very tough, but... Um, my understanding, too, is that it's it's possible to leave. It, it wasn't like that for a long time. It's one of the things the Gnostics did say, that they thought this was a soul trap, and once you come here, that you were stuck, and, and that you couldn't get out, even after death, uh, that they were holding us here. Yeah. I've okay. used the term that basically we've been in, in a quarantine zone, <laughs> not just on the planet, but yeah. even from the standpoint that... Um, yeah, incarnation has been messed with. And we've had people talk about this on the show, the fact that once you left here, you were basically in some sort of loop yep. that recycled you back into the system. There was no way to do what I guess you would call a refresher and be able to re reset your trajectory of your, your soul course. Yeah, no migration allowed. I mean, we're just stuck here. And uh, so I, supposedly that's changing, but... Uh, We'll see. We'll, we'll see. I, I really, you know, like I said, I, I don't even pretend to have all the answers. I mean, 29 years just to get to this point is it's pretty pathetic. But, you know, part of it is that um, uh, timing is important. Uh, you know, one of the things, like I said, I mean, between 87 and 2012, that was that was a very tough time for a lot of people as we were accelerating. Our consciousness was accelerated because our DNA was being reactivated. Mm hmm. To some degree. But then again, you've got the dark forces doing all kinds of crazy stuff like harp and dumping fluoride and, and, and the uh, the chemtrails and just, I mean, nonstop, really. They're, they are hardcore when it comes to this stuff. Uh, but, you know, since you're talking about world leaders, I mean, you know, here in America, we're, we're seeing the things are becoming more, um, they're coming out of the closet. They just are more bold about it. Actually, more desperate, I think, would be a better term. Uh, and what, like... I was telling you off the air, I think, you know, language is important. Terminology is, is very, very key to us having a better understanding of what we're dealing with. Like I said, this is an infection, okay? So it's not a judgment. If somebody's insane, it's, uh, you know, or acting evil, it's because they are infected. That doesn't excuse their behavior, okay? But it, at least it's a, f- a far better explanation than to say, you know, they're damned to eternal damnation. It's... That, that doesn't solve the problem. That's not even getting close to Well, no, that's part of the fear syndrome that they yes. keep you in because yes. that's all a feedback loop, too. It is. it is. And that's the whole point. That's why they keep us divided, conquered, and distracted constantly. It's, it's this thing that these parasites need to feed off of our negative energy. And the only way they can do that is constantly provoking us to hurt ourselves and others. We have to be angry and agitated, like, all the time. So... In any case, what I was trying to say here is we know for a fact that some of our world leaders are openly Luciferian. They just don't say it publicly, but we can we can trace this. I mean, in my second book, uh, Covert Encounters in Washington, D.C., I talk about John McNamara being a well-known Luciferian in Washington, D.C., which is it's all set up 
for satanic uh, practices. The entire city is is just a circuit board or like a uh, sort of like a giant Ouija board for for connecting to the Luciferian agenda, uh, as well as you know London and, and Rome. But uh, the our current president, he is uh, so what some people call a Linskyite. So is so is Hillary Clinton. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, but in fact, uh, Saul Alinsky's book Rule for Radicals, uh, Rules for Radicals. If you look at the uh, dedication there, it is dedicated to Lucifer, the light bearer. So it's not a joke. I mean, this is like, and uh, there's a lot of different organizations that are openly. Well, the uh, UN. Let's just start with the UN because the yeah. UN itself basically has deep connections going yes. back in history to what is now known as the Lucis Trust, but was originally. Yes. The, the the Luciferian Society. Yes, I mean, they kind of changed their name a little bit to to like that was that the League up. of the Nations. You know, yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, Cordell Hall was in there, and he was the guy that supposedly had access to alien bodies uh, that were kept in the sub basement of the Capitol with some wreckage of a, of a craft. The thing is, the technology was a trap. Not to, and it didn't start in 1947. Okay, I agree by the way, completely okay. with you on that. Yes, you know, so uh, th- th- what they do is manipulate. They they can't they don't create they manipulate. There's a huge difference again, and that's sophistry. It's it's magic. I mean, it's it's sleight of hand. It's like the Wizard of Oz. It's not it's not the true creative source, and it and it pay, and it actually paints the true creative source as something uh, in a much derogatory terms. You know, like the root of the word evil is Eve. They make Eve out sound like the you know the wicked witch. Like she screwed it up for everybody, and um, that's not true. We wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for the goddess energy. Uh, that, that, that divine principle is what creates our reality, you know. And um, so uh, it's, it's a, like I said, you know, this is going to be I, – I, for people who have no uh, context a, as they awaken, or I should say when they awaken, hopefully they do awaken, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. They will be utterly and totally conf- conflicted. Uh, their belief system, in other words, is going to break down. And so it will, um, that's going to be tough for them. I, and like I said, I don't know. I don't, see, the thing, you know, what's interesting about these shows, Randy, is that they are archived. And you never know when a person might accidentally or otherwise come across this and it might just resonate a little bit. That's why we're doing it. it it's sort of like, think of it this way, the, the cracking the egg shell. Yeah, yeah. You know, just cracking it enough, not shattering the whole thing all at once, but just, just t- tapping a little bit to, to, so that they, you know, might be able to find their way out of it at their own pace. Well, it's kind of like your website, which, you know, we kind <laughs> of we kind of have this narrative that we're spinning out. I mean... Myself, beginning this show's now, let's see, almost um, six years old mm-hmm. in in this form. And if you go back and through the archives, you're going to see that a lot of this was just me tearing at tearing at the fabric, ripping the mm-hmm. cushions out of the sofa and looking underneath it uh, to try and figure out what the hell was going on because I had my own experiences, I had my own insights. I spent a lot of years like you digging around trying to figure things out and fighting off, you know, the cognitive dissonance, the fluoride and the programming that comes from the media. But there's a relatability in what we're doing because we are able to put these out. And, yeah, I mean, people go on YouTube and and I see comments from people. I'm sure you do as well. (laughs) That basically they go, oh, my God. And I've gotten this exact comment. Oh, my God. I listened to this podcast and i really was like flipping out but now i'm kind of getting it and and you know those are the people that are sitting on the on the on the tipping point and yeah. they're ready to go over and what they needed to hear was a confirmation and some information that gave them a place to get a footing before they went over the other side well you know it's, that's a good term uh confirmation and it goes hand in hand with clarity it, it it's really essential to have those things in your life, uh, especially when you're dealing with things that are not mainstream or acceptable or correct, you know, uh, at least by societal standards currently. So uh, I recently came across the West Penray papers. Yeah, yeah. I, I was telling you about that off the air, but anybody who goes to my website now, you're going to find links to West Penray's papers 
all over the place because it is it has been confirmation clarity and ultimately closure on things like i said this this being of light i it just utterly baffled me who he w- was or is because i'm sure he still is uh with us on some weird level i mean um, well, they don't I, die, so you have no. to assume that the, the the consciousness and the energetic somehow extant in the in the present stream of space time. And they're watching the battlefield very closely, like nine dimensional chess. Nine. And uh, yeah. A lot of us are just pawns. <laughs> Some of us are actually have more value on the uh, chessboard than other pieces. You know. Of course, yeah. I don't feel like you and I are pawns, you know, because we 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 have a little more mobility. Uh, to, uh, to act, you know, but um, uh, so it's, it, it, you know, like I said, one of the things I would encourage people to go to my website, I make it really easy to get to the monuments in Malibu. Now, uh, I have for the first time put up uh, maps and uh, uh, hiking, you know, driving instructions and trail maps for people, because honestly, you can look at those pictures online and and really get a clue now. I mean, it, I did. A, I think I've done a decent job of um, comparing it, comparative analysis. You know, like a side by side of these sta- ancient statues with modern statues, so that you get a, a clearer picture of what we're dealing with here. And, um, uh, but I mean, if you can, a lot of people do go to L.A. It's just outside of Los Angeles, and. Um, uh, like I said, what's it just it gets weirder and weirder. Okay, well, here's the thing: is I'm reading the West Penry papers. Not only did I find out that this being of light is Prince Enlil, uh, heir to the throne of the Iran Empire, but he's also the one he and his mother created this world originally as a garden paradise. I believe that they're the ones that have created those monuments. However, the other thing that's off the coast there that I discovered in 2010, and it made it made headlines this year because uh, another talk show host and his cohorts they they saw it and ran with it, and I, I think they made some pretty outlandish claims. But you know, ultimately, I have shifted my position on this. I do think it's a underwater space base that was built by the Anunnaki, specifically by Enki, Lucifer. And his and his and his followers, because because he's aquatic, he is an amphib- yes, amphibianoid. That's part of a part of the the mythology, the legend. Well, it's I I think it's factual in the sense that we know him from different names or, or beings like him. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Oannes or the the Nomo or you know I mean it's it's he, a fish man. Even the hat of the Pope is a <laughs> fish. It's, yeah. it's a fish, and and they know it. They just don't want us to know these things. But so here's the other weird part. Michael was kind of, uh, he had it right. He had the pieces there. He just didn't fit them together, which is it's an ancient aquatic space base built by the Luciferians. And they have more than one base around this world, obviously. But um, that particular one, I believe, also is, has um, a faction of, uh, top secret, uh, like he said, space command. In other words, they he's groomed us. He the Luciferians have groomed us to be their servants, their slaves. Some of us are have moved up the ranks to be uh, part of his military and to serve in his military forces. You know, the the thing about it, people don't understand. The NSA is is a very small part of the larger picture. There's something called the global surveillance system. And I actually have uh, North American aviation models of those original nuclear-powered flying saucers. They're not saucer-shaped. They're sort of like a, uh, a heel. They call it a they call it a space platform right, or a lifting right. body. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Popular Science did a an expose on this, but the models, the pictures of the models that I have, show in great detail that these things were meant to go up for long term. And that they were, uh, they had a tremendous amount of surveillance equipment. Uh, it was, it, 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 in other words, and it, antennas and stuff that could, literally could not have stayed on there if it was flying at, a, you know, regular speed. It's, it's obviously any gravity of some kind. Anyway, the fighter model, the one that carried the nuclear missiles, the right. the serial number on this 
craft is 666. It's the counterpart to the, I know, this is, just doesn't make sense. I haven't put that picture up yet because I don't know. Honestly, you know, I mean, it's like, I guess that's part of the other thing, you know. Really? I've got so much stuff. Um, maybe I'm just sort of putting it out there, one piece. Well, and you're a little, being little circumspect, little bit of that. and there's probably wisdom in that because yeah. the shock value, especially when you toss 666 six out, yeah, six, yeah. Six, six out you know, obviously the biblical connotation and the fact that nobody really understands what that is anyway. Yeah. And religion has done nothing but obscure the the mystical meanings in that book and pretty much every other book as well. Well, look, religion is a control uh, mechanism. Con- it's a contrivance yeah. of the Luciferians. They did that to us on purpose. It was another mechanism not only to hijack our spirituality, but to also further divide us. Obviously, look at this so-called war on terror. It's uh, it's horrendous. You know, it's insidious too. It really is. But uh, uh, here, look, you and I had also talked a lot about what does the government know. And obviously, it, it depends who you're talking about or which agencies you're you're discussing. But uh, the global surveillance system is in part NSA. It's a, a larger part. It's the NRO. And uh, they don't really, I don't think they share that information with uh, our government directly. They're sharing it with uh, the so-called shadow government, which is the Luciferian. And I, I, I know people aren't going to like hearing that. I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. In my, I think it's a very well-educated opinion. I mean, I've worked really hard at this. It's not a hobby. You know, this is my life. This right. is my yeah. life, okay? But it's not about me. It's about us. I'm trying to figure this out. And the reason I take the time to share this information through shows, through books, articles, websites, whatever, uh, is because this is about us, and I do care very much. Uh, uh, I often tell people I didn't come here to make money. I came here to make a difference. You know, and in that regard, I feel like I am extremely wealthy. You know, if... Uh, on a different scale. Well, information scale. is wealth, and, and I think we both know that. that yeah. Yeah. You know, in spite of the fact that sometimes we struggle with the finances to even do what we do, um, <laughs> ultimately the knowledge itself is kind of the, um, I guess, the bow in the archer's hand that allows us to shoot information out. Uh-huh. For people who struggle with this stuff, I mean, it's not like there hasn't been public disclosure. It's just been bulldozed. Yeah. I don't know how many people remember the story of the British hacker Gary McKinnon. Yep. But McKinnon testified that he hacked into Pentagon computers and found a listing of officers' names under the heading of non-terrestrial officers. You know, so right. we, we, have, we have the sense, and look, the military... As uh, Michael Sala correctly inferred in that uh, video clip, is a corporate entity under a corporate government with corporate agencies doing business with other corporate entities. They're highly compartmentalized. They have a, a, a very strict hierarchical structure in how they convey information and who knows. You know, our presidents, some of them have known, some have known nothing. I think Eisenhower clearly had some idea because of what happened in on his watch. It seems that JFK and Bobby Kennedy also knew about this and planned to blow the whistle, and I believe Reagan as well was advised. But for the most part, the presidents, the, certainly the Congress, and everything underneath um, cosmic top secret level are probably blissfully unaware that any of this stuff is going on. Okay, but even if they are, and that's what I was the point I wanted to raise with you is because we've been having a kind of back and forth on this off the air was um, Colin Wilson, before he passed away, wrote quite yeah. a few books, a British author, folks, if you don't know him, Colin Wilson. Great he stuff. was, yeah, well, he, I mean, he knew his, he really did, knew, he knew a lot about the paranormal. And he had written a, a novel called The Mind Parasites. It's very similar to what I've been researching and experiencing. Uh, but he, I, he, I don't think he wanted to go directly to the heart of the matter for whatever reason. But oddly enough, reading that led me to, I think with your help, it was either you or someone else who s- sent me over to uh, another British author as Nick Redfern. Yeah. Uh, and it was called uh, Final Events. Yeah, Final with, Events. 
mm-hmm. with the with the the Collins elite. So we go from Colin Wilson to the Collins elite, and um, they were just one of two groups mentioned in that book that are part of our government or were part of our government in the military intelligence that were studying UFOs that came to the conclusion that uh, the occupants were demonic. And I I think they hesitated to use the word Luciferian because they don't, again, this is, you know, these guys have to remain covert or at least at this point. At this point, they have done a masterful job of remaining behind the scenes and yet manipulating everything. Well, this was a complete behind-the-scenes group in the Reagan administration. And they were highly religious, highly schooled um, in terms of of spirituality, but specifically from a a, a Hebrew Christian standpoint. And what Nick pointed out in that is that they were literally in the capacity— as part of the shadow government for making policies that uh, directed U.S. intelligence and military assets. Okay, so the thing is, at some level, people do know. And when they find out, they realize that there's nothing that they can do, that they're powerless. And so they might as well capitulate, you know, because there's a prize at the end of that, right? You get, you get some technology. They'll give you some goodies. But at what price? You know, and it's not like you really have a choice. They make you feel like you do. I mean, again, it's sophistry. They, they, it's, it's all sleight of hand. They have been lying to us and manipulating. And the reason they do it like that also, not only is to make it easier to manipulate uh, over time, I mean, the masses, but legally, when the benevolent ones complain about it, they say, they say to them, "Well, look, they agreed to it." You know, it's like, "Hey, look, Eve agreed to eat the apple. She's, you know, she's wicked." She's a sinner. Well, yeah, but you asshole, you, you were the one that talked her into it. You tricked her. And, <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's just a metaphor. Okay. Right, right. So, so, but it's true. I mean, it's, it's uh, on a much larger scale. They've done this many, many, many times in, in many, many, many ways. And that's, that's the really disturbing thing about uh, Nick Redfern's book, Final Events, is that the Colin Elite, they, uh, Colin's Elite, they talk about how, uh, how upsetting it was for them to see that there were factions of our government military complex that were <clears throat> interfacing with demons in the, in the hopes of getting some advantage over, let's say, the Russians or whoever they felt was our, our, our current enemy of the day, right? Yeah. But in fact, they were being played. They are being played. They are being played badly. We're all being played. I, I mean, that's understand. The, and that's the part of this that people need to wrap their minds around is yeah. your, your, your perfect Example of that being the dog with rabies. Well, yeah. basically, you you have a planet that has been infected to one degree or another, and based on our uh, our position in society, our upbringing, our social scale, we are being used and moved around by these entities for purposes of continuing their control grid. Yeah, well, again, it's not as though... I, I know a lot of people say, oh, they're just... They're just evil. It's their ego. Um, you're fine, yeah, but that's that's missing a, a, a key component, which is that they are ill. They're ill. They have an infection. It's a disease, and it, and and it's contagious. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. you see how it goes. You see how you can pass it on with uh, uh, the next generation. Okay. You you just look. Which God is it that uh, actually is being uh, served when you sever someone's head exactly? Mm-hmm. Uh, that wouldn't be the creator of the universe. Uh, she doesn't work like that. Uh, she doesn't demand blood sacrifice. That uh, the, the, You know, let me get back to when I Tell saw, you what. Let's, go, okay. can, we, can we hold this go over? Ahead, I wanna, ahead, we're going to go into another hour, and I want to I want to break here. And we're going to have a music break, Robin, uh, Robert, and uh, so. <laughs> Batman and Robin, yeah. Ba- Batman and Robin, uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Anyway, we're going to take a break here. We'll come back in about seven or eight minutes and continue our interview with Robert Stanley. This is Off Planet Radio, and we will be right back. Robert, just stay on the line.
into another dimension, a dimension of insight, a dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits. There are no boundaries. This is off planet radio. And my apologies for uh, a very disturbing computer malfunction. That was the sound of uh, what happens when a software program goes horribly awry. <laughs> and you do it live in front of an audience and there is really no way out. You sit in horror looking at this glitching software. This is Off Planet Radio Live. I'm Randy Moggins, and it is the 21st of November, 2014. As we drift into winter here, it is getting colder. Yes, the earth is getting colder. Um, we live in a world where distortion comes in so many different forms, and... Um, we now know about the myth of global warming as well, and uh, that's, a, that's a topic for another time, except that uh, we're starting to hear from NASA scientists who are telling us that they've known, and we've really known this, but our collective memory is so short, 40 years ago that we were heading into a cooling trend. The trends have actually been with us for well over 60 years, and yet um, the cognitive dissonance that was the global warming carbon tax movement uh, pioneered by the UN and Al Gore has kept us in the dark. So it's cold, it's getting colder, and it's also um, a time when we need to look beyond the external and look to the internal. My guest is Robert Stanley. UnicusMagazine.com is his website. And uh, Robert, welcome back for the second round. Thank you, Randy. It's... Uh, I, I can't say enough how horrified I was as I sat here, unable to control the software that's running these music feeds until I mm. finally had to hit the kill, kill switch on it. But um, I know you can appreciate it because you've done broadcasting as well, uh -huh. that it is uh, quite the nightmare sometimes. Often, far too often. Recently, Robert, the, uh, the Pope, um, Benedict, uh, came out with some very strong statements and uh, regard, well, and a position regarding the practice of exorcism, which is apparently making its return back into uh, the mainstream of the faith. And uh, this practice of exorcism, which is basically the attempt to violently remove demonic spirits from a, a human subject, is looming large in our consciousness again. You and I have talked about this a little bit, and I think we're in agreement about the position of what is being attempted and what's actually going on in, in the spiritual realms regarding exorcism. Yeah, though, as I say, the parasites are paranormal or etheric. They, they're they not exactly physical, but they, because, we're, you know, we're not, we're more than physical as well. Uh, let's put it in this terms. In, from the Islamic perspective, the jinn are something that everybody has, at least one, and they're usually assigned at birth. Right. Uh, okay, so in a book, someone sent me a book recently, an author wrote this book called Invoking the Light, and it talks a lot about this and how to remove the attachment that was assigned to you at birth, which was a fascinating subject to me. I thought, you know, wow, interesting timing. Um, I would love to do this. So I tried it. My wife tried it. It seemed to work really well, very helpful. Um made a lot of sense, too. It's like, you know, again, this is kind of what was going on with the, the situation in Malibu when I, you know, that I, I didn't know the boy was possessed, but, you know, whatever. I, I was in an altered state, uh, blood everywhere, and, um, uh, uh, you know, adrenaline flowing, and uh, I saw these things in the room there, and I was utterly shocked by it. I was like, I, I thought I was hallucinating, actually, you know. Um, but, obviously, unfortunately, I wasn't. So, uh the, the thing is that they are um, extremely pervasive, and, and I know there's a lot of people who say they can help you get rid of them, and obviously the Catholic Church is one of them, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a whole long process you got to go through in order to qualify, and then I go through whatever, all the rituals and whatnot. Obviously, it's not working, and I, I, I feel that it is incumbent upon us to address the problem directly, 
because it's such a personal thing, like uh, Castanetus wrote, that these things had literally, um, uh, they had given us their mind. They had, they had imp- over- overlaid their mind on ours so that we couldn't even tell. And this is one of the reasons that they do everything covertly is because they don't want It's sort of like a tick. You know, when a tick bites you, you don't feel it. That's a pretty good trick, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's And then it's it much, stays there and it continues to suck off I, of you. And you it don't, becomes uh, bloated. Yeah, and that's usually when you find it. I remember that only happened to me once as a kid, and I absolutely oh. freaked out. Freaked out. It's like, holy God, get this off of me, you know? Um, yeah, And, you know, recently my dog's been getting attacked by him out here in uh, Rhode Island. We had a, a really bad uh, spell of it. And um, I was at the vet, and she pulled one off, and, and it made that sound yep, you know yep. she pulled it and then i go oh that's why they call them ticks because every you know when you you if you do it that way you you use force they you can literally hear them releasing uh for me i find the best way and not that i like it okay like i'm just saying folks if you have to do this put a drop of uh, iodine or uh colloidal silver on there and let it sit there for a while what that does is or even just warm water what it'll do is open up the pores softens up the membrane and, and then they, they can't grip as well. And then you gently rotate them. Gently rotate them and gently pull, and they just come right off. You don't have to pull hard. They don't pop. You don't accidentally get the head stuck in there. And you, Sorry to mention this to you. I know that's kind of gross, but it's we're talking well, about. Yeah, but it's a great metaphor because it is spiritually nobody wants to think about the fact Mm-mm. that they've got these attachments, and yet, I've been in Reiki readings. I mean, I've had entities pulled off of me. I've seen them yeah. on other people. Yeah. Um, and this is an important aspect as well, is developing an awareness for these things. The reason why these beings, these entities are able to get away with this is because we have complete cognitive dissonance when it comes to the presence of these entities. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they do kind of numb us. You and I they kind of got have windows open in terms of being able to see them. Shattered and, and, windows. Yeah, exactly. Well, in your case, literally, yeah. Yeah, that was... I'll never forget the sound of that sliding glass door breaking open. I mean, literally shattering as the boy ran full speed into it. it and it wasn't safety glass, too, which I couldn't understand. Uh, there was just... It was... Um, it, it was sickening. It was just, there was something, and you know, I guess what it too, what it was, it was almost like ringing the dinner bell for these things, um, because there was so much negative energy coming out of that child and his grandparents. So there was three people in that up there on the second floor when this event happened, and it it triggered. It wasn't just the blood. I mean, this is one of the reasons people do the blood sacrifice because it's it it's it's like it's a banquet for uh, mm-hmm. on the etheric mm-hmm. level for mm-hmm. these um again because of the dna uh it, it, you know see because dna emits light but, yes absolutely but, but, yes. but okay but it there's a healthy frequency and then there's the unhealthy frequency and when, when we're traumatized it, it there's a different frequency of light that's coming off of us and that's what they feed off of again I, this is why I, I, I don't think these things even belong in our universe i really believe that they're they're alien in the full sense of the term alien foreign foreign not from here not just earth i mean not even from this universe well and then there is this whole blood thing because this goes back yeah. into the ancient mystery religions the 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 ritual sacrifice i mean yeah you know one of my one of my most horrible uh coming to truth moments was when i looked back in the old now i was raised it's pretty much a fundamentalist Christian from my grandparents, my parents forward. And that was part of my life for a long time. But at yeah. one point, I looked into the Old Testament and I went, wait a minute. This God that they have here is a lunatic. He's a psychopath. Um, obviously, if he told his son, I mean, if he told Abraham to slaughter his son. Slaughter his own son. Yeah. And so the, whoever showed up and said, hey, Abraham, calm down, you know, uh, uh, it, it's a different, different entity altogether. That it's so it's interesting how they twist everything around. But yes, the 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 sacrifice of children to Baal yeah. is is completely Luciferian. More like worship, yeah. all that. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 still going on. Burning it, altars where they place the firstborn male child into a into a brazier 
yeah. and basically burned it alive. I mean, yeah. and these are recorded in the ancient books. The, we're not making this up. So there's something, like you pointed out, an energetic, almost like a, I would think that on the spiritual level, it's like a sexual euphoria that is gained by this type of activity. Um, okay. I, again, I, th- I think of it more as just uh, the matrix. The analogy there was that we are their batteries. Okay, good. Uh, good because one. They are, they're very mechanical. They don't have human emotions. I know we try and assign that to uh, everything, but we, we need, I hope people understand when I say this, I mean, I mean this quite sincerely. You don't know how special you are. You're part of a, a, a unique experiment uh, here. And the DNA that we all have, even though it's been badly manipulated uh, uh, from its original, uh, whatever, uh, ma- uh, not matrix, uh, design, was originally created as something truly unique, fantastic. Uh, we have things that other races only can only dream of and wish for. But again, that's been altered. It's been diminished. It's been distorted, badly distorted. And um, uh, it's another reason why that the the Royal House of Orion does not want to see the experiment completely lost. That's what makes it very complicated. Explain a little bit about your understanding of the House of Orion and what that means. Because I know that has a meaning, and I know it has a meaning yes, to you as well. Well, did you see the artifacts? Um that I found in Malibu? Have you seen that page yet? Yes, I did. And, and okay, I've so, heard you describe it as uh, well. Go into that. Okay. Well, I mean, it's 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 part of the the lesson plan, mm-hmm. not just for me, but the fact that they are they had such a have such a strong influence. I mean, this is we're part of their empire, and yet we somehow don't know that because again, it's it's it, it was hijacked, and the current leadership is illegitimate so but anyway uh the the shumash indian or the shumash na- nation they didn't call themselves that but whatever that's just what the europeans call them uh they were all held together by a a group a secret society called the on top a n t a p all right and only uh, this year I, I realized that the i have one of their artifacts it was given to me and um after reading Sitchin's work, I mean, I had this thing for years, but after reading Sitchin's work, I started to look at it again and think, you know, maybe this is one of those cylinder seals. And I rolled it out. Boy, the first time I rolled it out in, in, in wet clay, I thought, wow, you know, this is amazing. But but what's even more curious about it is that it took me over 20 years. In fact, it wasn't until this year that I actually uh, finally looked at it. The star map went, oh, come on, duh. That's the Orion's belt, you know, and and then I was like, okay, that makes that makes sense. It's in all the mythology, right? I mean, you know, mm-hmm. it's a home of the gods, right? Mm-hmm. Or one of the homes of like Sirius and Orion. But uh, so then, though, somehow I started. I, I it it again. It, these these lessons come in in stages because uh, I guess it's more than I could handle, and I just whatever. It's like any other classroom. You have to you know you do one thing that leads to the next. I finally deciphered what on top means. A N T A P actually means on for on new, uh, which is another another way of saying Orion. And uh, op A P is literally the the word for house. So you know, just like Spanish, if you like, if we in English, if you ha- you say uh, a, a phrase, it would come out sort of backwards in Spanish, mm-hmm. and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it's the same thing here. So in instance. Uh, Anu's house really means it means house of Anu, you know, like the royal house of Anu. That's a title, by the way. It's not a name. It's a title because he is the king. I mean, it, you know, uh, and his it, oddly enough, according to the West Penray papers, there is the king and Lil and and queen, his queen, con, his queen. All right, the queen of Orion. Their son, his son, is also named Enlil, Prince Enlil. So it gets a little confusing, but you know that happens a lot in families. There's, you know, junior, senior, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So so the other thing that's really confusing, and I, I, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but it just is. I know this is for a fact because I learned this from living out here in, in New England for the last six years. Uh, I met a Native American uh, elder, and he told me about how uh, the leaders all had multiple names. 
they were known by them, and they used it to their advantage, you know, for subterfuge and, and security. Uh, but apparently the gods did too. I think they still do it. There's, and, uh, yeah, you find the, the different pantheons um, going back, and, and depending on the culture, how they're identified. But when you look closely at them, it appears as though they're all being spoken of. It's one, one yeah. entity with different names that appeared in different A group cultures. of entities group. with different names. Yeah. yeah. And like I said earlier, is that the victor, in this case, Lucifer, has uh, and his son, Ra, Marduk, whatever, he, uh, they have uh, intentionally misled the scribes and or destroyed entire libraries that they didn't agree with or didn't want to be existent because it would expose them, you know, and, which is something they don't want. It, may, it, it makes it a lot harder to control us if we know what's going on. It's one of the reasons when, um, you know, slaves from Africa were brought over here, it was illegal to teach them how to read and write because mm -hmm. they didn't want them to be educated or, or intelligent on any level because it's just, it's just harder. It's just harder to control them. So we see this now in the election cycle recently. It's coming out about health care uh, here in America. <laughs> that, that It's been admitted that they had to lie to us for our own good, you know, because we're too stupid to figure it, you know, to, to know what's good for us. Right. Right. Uh, and this is this is typical sophistry of the Luciferian agenda. They they really have a very dim view of us. Um, and um, well, they didn't want to tell you, first off, that written in that that millions of words health care bill that nobody apparently read right. was, in fact, um, the ability to begin doing um, euthanasia legally inside right. of institutions, and also the fact that they intended to implode the entire private health care system, a, what, mm -hmm. $17 billion a year industry, right. and fold it into what will eventually become a single-payer plan. So, no, they didn't want to tell you that. No, and, and but they knew that was, the, that was the goal, and we have people on record saying that, such as Senator mm -hmm. Obama and this goofy professor from MIT. And well, I'll go back to Hillary Schnitzel Clinton in the, in the yeah. Clinton administration. Oh, yeah, yeah Hillary Care. Yeah. Well, she's another Olinskyite. Oh, I told you. Gosh, she's yeah. a Luciferian. Mm -hmm. She, mm -hmm. by the correct terminology, see, this is a thing. If people would actually tell the truth, uh, a lot of this stuff, wouldn't, people wouldn't stand for it, obviously. Um, but, you know, it is what it is, and we have to do the best that we can with what we have. And... Um, but it's important also to know that it's evolving. The situation is constantly evolving, right? And that's that's the main reason I've been doing a lot of a lot of public speaking about this. Uh, I, um, you know, it, I know a lot. I know there's other people that have figured this out, but we're really in the minority. And uh, what I find kind of comical is is how um, I mean I understand it. People, it's it's really funny. Is, Ironic, I guess, would be a better term. Uh, people will write to me and say, well, you know, so-and-so doesn't agree with you or, or somebody yeah. else. It's like, wow, well, you guys don't agree on this, so who's right? Uh, and, and it's not like that. It isn't like that at all. We're just trying to figure it out. You know, from, from one pr angle, it might look like something. That from another angle, it looks like something else. You know, I mean, it takes a lot of effort. I mean, I think for, from a Native perspective, Native American perspective, is that you really don't understand something until you walk around it in a full circle and look at it from every angle. Yeah, walk, you walk know? in another and, man's moccasin, so to speak. But, but yeah. it, it really takes a lot of uh, courage and dedication to, to uh, an open-mindedness. You know, the courage part comes in, I mean, this is... Because, you know, there's a lot of peer pressure to conform. And if you go against the, the uh, you know, whatever the current wisdom of the day is, the, the group think, people uh, tend to not just shun you, but they feel threatened. And so they, you know, they, they'll retaliate. Not, I, I know it's not like anybody's really trying to, you know. Well, the retaliation is very subtle. It starts it is, with usually. malfunctioning Just, computers and phones that don't work mm -hmm. and, and things that break down. And then there's the spiritual and psychological 
aspect that comes in as well. I mean, yeah. And and I know you know this because you've been in the trenches. <laughs> There's just yeah. an enormous amount of oppression that goes on psychologically and spiritually when you're doing this kind of work. Yeah, it can be pretty uh, overwhelming. And I really think that's uh, why that that night I was up there on the mountain all night. Um, mostly, I, I mean, not mostly. I, I spent at least three or four hours. I was just completely out of my body. And what's really bizarre is that, uh, I know I've told this before, but it's just interesting to me is that when I when I – came back i really thought only like maybe a minute had gone by you know I, I wasn't asleep i had just laid down i was like maybe two minutes laying down and boom i just i just floated out of my body and and the next thing i know after i see this guy and, and i it, it just it, sh it was so shocking i mean the next thing i know i'm sitting bolt upright and and um and then i realized wait a minute the moon has moved I don't. I usually don't wear a watch. Okay, so I I wasn't looking at a clock. I could tell by the position of the moon that hours had gone by, and I'm just like, wait a second. That is, I that's never happened to me before. I don't even sleep that well on a bed. I was laying on cement. You know, <clears throat> it's like what? What was that all about? You know, I mean, it's like total, totally lucid in the light. Somebody in my face, claiming to be my father, glowing like a light bulb, and then the next thing I know. I'm sitting bolt upright and hours have gone by with nothing in between that. It's like that, that made no sense at all. I mean, seriously, that was, ah, boy, it just got weirder and weirder and weirder. I, and so let me just, I'll just finish how weird it really was. Okay. So I come down off the mountain when the sun comes up, I, find, I go back down to the beach where I was working. And, and at some point I thought, well, I better go see if that kid's still alive. I mean, I, it's like I don't even know this kid, but for some reason I felt really horrible about the whole thing, you know. Um, and um, I guess there was I, somehow some weird connection, even though I didn't know him. And I only I like uh, anyway. So I walked into the house, and uh, the grandparents came to the top of the stairs, and uh, I said, uh, you know. Is he okay? And they said, yeah, he's going to live. He lost a lot of blood. He had to have over 300 stitches in his face. I'm like, oh, my, you know, wow, okay, wow, well, okay. Uh, I mean, I could believe it, you know. Um, and then I said, I, like, it was so spontaneous. I mean, totally unrehearsed. I just said, uh, you can heal the scars on his face, but unless you heal the scars on his soul, this is going to happen again. And And I was like, Oh, wow. Did I really just say that? You know, I, I honestly, I still think about that with like, I don't do stuff like that. You know, I'm at work. Well, something These, was speaking a message. I mean, in the right, religious some level. Yeah. Some, I mean, in a religious level. realm, you would be it would be said that you had prophesied. Yeah, I, I guess if you had to put I, it on those terms. Yeah, I know the terms are uncomfortable, but uh, it's com it, it's it's easy to understand. You make an utterance that comes from somewhere else other than your present conscious knowing. Because they blocked it. Look, the, I, I believe the benevolent, and this is the whole point I'm even bringing this up. I believe the benevolent ones, knowing that this is a battlefield, even though I was unaware of that at the time, as a young man of 25, uh, it would have been overloading me, my senses, my sensibility. I, I, I would have no real context for it. It would have... It made me feel even like more crazy. I mean, I thought I was going nuts, actually, a little bit. Um, you know, like traumatized. Yeah. And and um, man, so <laughs> I walked out of there, and and I was utterly baffled. I mean, totally perplexed. And um, at least I wasn't under attack, though. See, that was the that was the only real upshot of that whole deal was. I thought was wow, you know. Uh, somehow, uh, the, whatever those things are, they're not attacking me because I, I didn't feel it anymore, you know. And actually, I didn't even feel them in the house anymore, which I thought was interesting. Um, and uh, um, so I go back to where I was, my little whatever, I stationed there, you know, guarding the beach for the rich people, and um, and. Um, 
Uh, well, not just rich people. I mean, these are prominent Hollywood types like Spielberg and, and you know, a, a lot of actors, Shatner, a bunch of them. They were all there. And um, I mean, it's just that was the beach. But, uh, OK, it was a, specifically it was a haven for mm-hmm. movie stars, mm-hmm. producers, mm-hmm. big time heavyweight lawyers. I mean, it, it was it was a weird place. Okay, a lot of strange. Well, anybody stuff. that's anybody that's spent any time in L.A., anybody that's been in Hollywood, and I know people there, will tell you it's an enclave for Luciferianism, for all types of practices and occult things that go on. I mean, just look at the long history of Hollywood, going back to the '30s. I think with the famous Fatty Arbuncle scandal, forward to yeah. the Manson family. And what goes on in Hollywood today? There is something in that location that's significant, but also I think the collective consciousness of the people who come there and the reason why they're there has something to do with the spirit they're manifesting. Uh, you know, and this is uh, Jack Parsons was born there, claimed to be the Antichrist. Mm-hmm. Alistair mm-hmm. Crowley went there. You got to understand, they call it the Bell city. Ron of, Hubbard. Yes, they call it the city of the angels. What they don't tell you is that the city of fallen angels. Now, on on my for my part, uh, so just so people are clear about my heritage, is that um, my father was a minister. When I was conceived, he was a minister. Uh, that's where he met my mom. Was at the uh, Self Realization Fellowship. He his guru was uh, Paramahansa Yogananda. Uh-huh. So I had that as my uh, foundation. I am not a religious person. But I understand spirituality, metaphysics, and ultimately uh, that every institution that man has built is corrupt, including churches. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mm -hmm. and and, and that would include the Self-Realization Fellowship, by the way. So, um, but, but, you know, the point is, um, at least I had, I'm sure I chose that path for a reason because it served me well. It's something I was comfortable with or I could resonate with. Um, and I, I am, you know, there's, I just, I, I just reject the, this whole, uh, parasitic issue that we're dealing with. Uh, and yet I'm not here to judge these people for their behavior. You know, like I say, you don't, even if your dog gets rabies, it's like you hate the dog. You right, just have right. to deal with the consequences of it, you know, in the most humane way possible and hope nobody gets hurt. Right. So this is this is again this is the reason why I've been so adamant. But it, it really it almost cost me my life, you know, because um, even though I survived that situation in 1985 in September, um, at, by 1989 I was really starting to get a lot more information about what was going on, so-called conspiracies, right, and um, uh, specifically cloning the Greys things like that. And it was, it was very troubling. And, um, it was at a time when everything was falling apart in my life. It felt like I lost my job at the beach. I lost my girlfriend. Um, and I had to move out of Malibu. I was living in the city in Santa Monica and, uh, uh, just working in a very toxic environment. (laughs) And I don't really like the city anyway, but, um, so I was, uh, I was not well. I had like, like, pretty severe case of bronchitis and um i was laying in bed and i was thinking to myself i'm not sorry for um wanting to know the truth even though it's very ugly i i really you know i feel no regret i am not sorry you know right that's what i'm thinking to myself the phone rings i pick it up and there's a voice a very mechanical like a literally like a machine robotic speaking. It, yeah, I mean, it, it, it sounded, it could have been, a, the thing was, it was a language I've never heard before. And I've traveled, at, at that time, I'd already traveled to 57 countries. I, I've seen a lot, heard a lot of stuff. But um, I never heard that language before. And it, it's not like it, it didn't, it was already in mid-sentence when I picked up the phone. You know, it wasn't like a normal, hey, Robert, we know what you're thinking or something like that in, in weird language. It was... They were already the, the one thing I could discern from the the inflections of the voice was that whatever it was, it was mad at me, it, or it was just angry. It was really angry, it sounded angry, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And so the only thing I could think to say was, 
I'm sorry. And I, what I meant was, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. I didn't say, I just said, I'm sorry. And I hung up. And then I realized, wait a second. That's what I just, no, I, I just did exactly what I said. I, you know, you know, I just said, I, I'm not sorry. Yeah. yeah. And they, they tricked me into saying, you're, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. And I'm and like, oh, that. so, so again, this is the, the sophistry, the, the, the utter deceptive, manipulative behavior. And um, and it has it has a purpose, okay. And it really pushed my button in a way that I I never want to experience that again, because at that point I felt hopeless, I, I, in the sense that I didn't have any support group. I had no one to talk to, um, and I was learning these things. And some of it I just I mean, like I said, I experienced. I knew I look. I was having multiple close encounters, and I that you can't go. There's no one you can call for help with that. There is no, 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 there no. is no UFO helpline. No, uh, they funded don't. By, they... Funded by the state or the government. No, and what I think actually makes it worse when you go to these UFO conferences. That's why uh, I don't go. I really don't. No, I, don't I never either. waste my no. time because it's it's infiltrated and it's literally the blind leading the blind and somebody's trying to sell you a book and all that crap and it's just like, so uh, anyway, I, I I felt like hopeless and and at that point I said, well, screw it. I just I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to kill myself. It couldn't be any worse than this, you know. I'm li- I'm living in hell, <clears throat> and uh, uh, so I I thought I actually thought I was going to go up to the mountains in Malibu and just toss myself off a cliff there. But um, then a friend of mine, same guy, actually went up to uh, near uh, China Lake with um, this buddy of mine. He's, he's like, "Hey, let's go to this this spot I know over in." Uh, it's right on the San Andreas Fault. It's kind of like the, you know, the mountains in Malibu. There's this really interesting rocks and caves and whatever. I'm like, okay, sure, yeah. I didn't tell him I was gonna, you know, toss myself off a cliff. But um, uh, so we go there, and again, like I said, I had really bad bronchitis. It was borderline pneumonia. And <laughs> when I went there, and I was I was sleeping on the ground, and uh, and it was like a light covering of snow. It was cold. It was really cold. Probably the dumbest thing. Not I exactly done. the healthiest place to be. With well, I didn't care. I thought I was going to kill myself the next day anyway, so it was no big deal. I really, you know, whatever. And um, it was an interesting place because the energy was so high from the uh, the fault line. Mm-hmm. It, you could hear the place humming. I could hear it humming. It was just bizarre. I mean, really interesting energy. So I'm laying there on the ground next to this stream, snow on the ground, and I I have a lucid dream. I literally wake up right in my dream, in my dream. I wake up, get out of my sleeping bag, uh, and I saw someone standing over in the distance. I thought it was weird. So naturally, I'm curious. I go over there, and it's a woman. She's wearing, similar to the man, a, 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 like a toga kind of thing, except hers was, was not so radiant or white. It was more like a a greenish color, and she... Uh, she looked pretty normal to me, um, but she said something that was just utterly profound. I mean, it had such a profound effect in the uh, total opposite direction to what those other things said to me. She said, um, if you decide to stay, we will do everything we can to help you, which is exactly what I needed to hear, right? Yeah. It took me from being hopeless to suddenly having, being hopeful, but I was still very ill. I was very fragile. And so she she held up a crystal like I've never seen before. Uh, it had multiple terminations on it, but more like tourmaline, you know, that they're flat on mm-hmm. the top. Mm-hmm. Okay. So she, she held this out, and she says, place your hand on the crystal. Okay, sure. I don't know what that is. Fine. And I put my hand on there. Whoa. And it was like jump starting a car. It uh, there. I, I don't know where this energy was coming from, but... It, it ran through my arm. My entire body was just electrified. Not, not in a bad way. It was just shocking, literally, because I didn't ex- she didn't warn me. <laughs> hmm. I guess that was a good... So you know that the thing used to shake hands with somebody with a buzzer? Yeah, yeah, there's hand buzzers. <laughs> yeah, damn. <laughs> Cosmic buzzer. Anyway, it's funny now, but it wasn't funny at the time. Um, and again, the next thing I remember was waking up going, what was that all about? But the uh, the thought, the intent of killing myself was gone, and um, I rapidly improved after that too. My my chest cleared up, and obviously I'm still here. And uh, 
So, and I know now looking back on it, I can see where she, she kept her word. They kept, I don't know what, who, when she said we, I don't, I assume that would have been the benevolent ones. Because again, you know, like in the Bible says, you'll know them by their fruits. fruits. Yeah. And, and, and this is why, why I was struggling. I told you, you know, pr, you know, sort of post to the show is, uh, I, I, I was not clear, you know, cause Lucifer apparently is also originally a being a bright radiant being of light and he can really fool people he's, he's very very smooth talker and um also a shapeshifter uh like a lot of yeah. beings are yeah. and uh so it's very very easy for them to manipulate and deceive us uh but in any in any case i i don't think that's what was has been done to me i mean yeah look i've been played by both sides but the, you can always tell the benevolent ones do not uh, force you to do anything. They don't trick you into it. They always respect your free will. And um, um, what's curious to me also is is how well we are monitored. I know that's that's something a lot of people. It made me really uncomfortable when I the the first time I realized that 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 they're reading our thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Your right to privacy is severely compromised by. Yeah, this. yeah, 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 yeah. It really is. And I, like I said, it was. Uh, uh, shocker. Uh, I think it was 86 or 80, whatever. I was coming down out of the mountains one night and I, I could feel them. I could feel them watching me. It was bizarre. And so as it, just as an experiment, I, I looked up into this one area of the sky and I said, mentally, I just said, Hey, I know you, I know you're up there. Uh, why don't you just show yourself? I'm not going to hurt you. And then the light turned on. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Like I said, it's funny now, but it was really not funny at the time. It was like uh, uh, my brain was just fried. I, 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 it's like all my circuits were overloaded. That, that was, again, I wasn't, I really wasn't, I, you know, I just, you got to watch out. Sometimes you, it's like sticking your finger in a socket. I was testing it, and I got my answer, and oh, my God. You know, it's like uh, I, uh, it took me. A few days to actually calm down after that, you know, uh, it, it was um, like I say, I, it, it was a, a shattering. It sh- really, uh, sh- <laughs> like I don't have anything to hide. Really, it's just that I it, that was not. Uh, wow, I guess it's a good thing. Look, and, and it wasn't the last time. It happened again in two thousand and nine. It was demonstrated to me uh, after I did a radio show with somebody out here in Rhode Island. I was, uh, you know, doing a show like this, and I was talking about all the the work I'd put into, uh, you know, reporting on, you know, covert UFO UFO activity in Washington D.C. And I was actually very frustrated. It's like, come on, how many, how much more evidence do I have to pull out of a hat here and p- present to everybody before they pay attention or do something about it? Obviously, that was pretty naive of me, but whatever. I was. <laughs> I was really frustrated. So afterwards, it's like 10 o'clock at night. I walk out in front of the house with my dog, and I'm looking up at Orion's belt, obviously, you know, figures. And um, I, I, I'm, i like, yelling at them. Mm-hmm. I was like, are you mm-hmm. are you nuts? Mm-hmm. What do, you, yeah. are you, do you really expect me to do something about this? I mean, I'm one person. You know, Washington, D.C. is this, this giant bureaucracy. Uh, you know, I... I, I People aren't getting the message. They don't want to hear it, okay? I was like, why aren't you doing something? I'm like, so anyway, I was just blowing off some steam, really. I was just had to vent. And sure enough, 12 hours later, I came back out to the yard, front yard, and and <laughs> there was a UFO. And uh, I, it, was, it literally came and parked over the backyard. It was probably a couple thousand feet up. And I ran in the house, and I got my camera, and I took some pictures of it just to prove to people – uh, just like when the black helicopter showed up, you yeah. know, if you, if you don't have pictures of that, uh, y- yeah, you could talk about it, but, um, it, it makes it a lot more interesting and hopefully more plausible for people when they see the, the photographic evidence. So we can at least have some sort of, uh, coherent discussion about these things. I sometimes tend to think though, despite all the evidence that we have, and it's just, just, People out there constantly disclaiming, oh, yeah. and debunking, and it, it, you get to the point where you go, you know, 
for someone who doesn't believe, no evidence will ever convince them. And if you do believe, no evidence is necessary, although it is provide. Isn't it interesting how once you're open, things begin to come at you, which I, I sure. think I, and I'll be very honest with you. You know, I, I think some people come into this world wide open. Mm -hmm. They are predisposed, predestined somehow to be able to process things that other people can handle. I don't know what soul state that is or where that comes from, but, you know, you meet people in your life, and I've met a couple who uh, are just predisposed to open and are able to crack open that, that cosmic egg a little bit and peer inside or outside or yeah. whatever it is. So what you basically do is you reflect back to the audience your own openness to experience, which obviously, just by nature of the force of it, is both positive and negative and very difficult to navigate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, extremely. And But look, I'm not complaining. I'm just exp I'm trying to explain. I'm trying to help people understand this is not a, you know, a walk through the park and, uh, uh, I'm not asking for sympathy. I just, I just, this is just part of the conversation uh, that it's, it is traumatic. Okay. It, ha it is traumatic to uh, deal with these experiences and then put years and years of research into it, trying to make sense of it only to be misled uh, along the path. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, or punished. You know, because that is, it is a huge stigma. It still is. I know things have changed a lot. Um, no, it's and, the biggest stigma, I think. I think It really still is. It scares the crap out of people, honestly, especially this thing with Washington, D.C. I've never seen so many people run from the story in my life, you know, and I ended up owning it because nobody else wants to touch it. There are so many people out there. And I know because I get the emails from them who are hiding. <laughs> they're closeted experiencers. Yeah. Yeah. Who would like to talk to somebody? People like you and I sometimes are kind of a, a, a welcome way station for people who other, otherwise feel disconnected and cut off from True. being able to express things. I mean, I get massive amounts. Sometimes I get emails <laughs> that are like 20 pages long. You ever get this? Uh huh. Um, it's like they, they dump their entire journal on you. But, yeah. and that, that's not a bad thing because. Honestly, I've gleaned a lot of information over the years. It's been very affirming. Sure. Uh, but, again, putting the voices out there, putting the experiences out there, helps those people who are not comfortable with this to be a little bit bolder in their seeking and perhaps even in their sharing of experiences because we're we're kind of at the nexus point here in terms of this planet and where it's going. and. Mm -hmm. I can't help but think that that is part of what you're doing, what I'm trying to do with this show, is to get people to a place where it won't be such a, a shot of cold water when, when they get hit with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's right. I mean, it's just, you know, I know this is a kind of a buzzword, unsustainable. Yeah. It was, it was never meant to be going this direction for this long, but it is, it has, you know. And obviously, there's a lot of things that interventions, minor ones, that have occurred along the to get us this far. Um, but like I said, I'm you know this is the main reason I've been doing a lot of extra public speaking is because of what I saw coming. And again, it's not like I don't have anything else to do. Um, it's just <laughs> I ask these questions. No, we really actually do have a life. Yeah, I got a family by the yeah. by the way. You know, uh, I mean, we I know you do too. So it's mm -hmm. like uh, it, it takes a lot of effort to uh, and focus well, and you're to stay there, with you, us. You're doing talk shows all the time. I mean, you're on just doing Michael Vara's show. Uh, yes, and I'm doing Coast to Coast on Monday night. Good, excellent. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, uh, hopefully, I survive it. <laughs> I got. A, I had a question <laughs> pop up on on, on chat here. Um, they wanted to know if you felt like the this current generation, the, the newer generation, is perhaps a bit more open? Is this something you're seeing, that we're, we're seeing a generational shift towards an openness of this phenomena? No, it's across the board. Um, I mean, like, well, because my son is 19, so I can, I'm, 
Look, it's it's really an individual thing. Yeah. But uh, but anybody who was born after eighty seven is has lived through that is more open. Anybody. Okay. So if if you mean by that that generation, mm-hmm. yeah, from yeah. eighty seven forward, yes, they ha- they have to be because the DNA was uh, has been altered back towards the, you know, I would consider a very positive place. What, what do you mark in 1987 as being part Harmonic of... Harmonic convergence. Okay, that's what I thought you were going to say, yeah. I was up on the, uh, I was up at the mountains. I, I was taking people up there a lot at that time, but particularly for the Harmonic Convergence. And, um, God, the the, uh, the night before was... In, yeah, let's see. Oh, anyway, it was around that time, one of the nights before, uh, there was something incredibly bright green came down over L.A. It lit up all of Los Angeles from above. It looked like it was going to hit L.A. as it came down, and then it just, it just, it just turned off. It was not a military flare. It was moving at an incredible rate of speed. It was so bright. It was, I mean. We were all, we were all running around in circles, like thinking, you know, "Holy crap, we're going to get wiped out!" You know, it was weird. It was totally silent too, by the way. Mm-hmm. Emerald green. Yeah. Okay, so then the actual morning of the harmonic converted convergence, I was back up there uh, with a couple people, and um, we were sitting there meditating, and it was very quiet up there. And then suddenly, just before the sun came up, all the dogs and all the coyotes in the area started howling. It was freaky. It, it it gives me the chills just thinking about it because that's what happened when it happened. I was like getting the chills going. I'm saying to these people, "Do you hear that?" They're like, "Yeah." How could you not hear that? You know, it's like, what are they hearing? I couldn't hear it. I could hear them howling, but obviously they were hearing something that that you know beyond the human range of hearing, and uh, they were reacting to it. And it, boy, it caused a reaction in me. I, like I said, I still get the chills when I think about it. it was, <clears throat> you know, like I said, do you, you know, you know, you're never going to hear about this on the news. The news is just, you know, it's, no, it's no, just, the news it's is all a distraction. No, well, the news is designed to keep you in the state in which you'll never yep. hear that because provokes us, yeah, constantly. It's fear. It's it's yeah, uh, being focused on money and materialism, which are the great enemies of spiritual awakening right now. It, That's why it, you have this onslaught of economic uh, disaster. Yeah, but you know, speaking of news, I thought it was really ironic because of the books that I wrote, specifically the first book I wrote about uh, UFOs in Washington D.C. I sent it. I was listening. I listened to a lot of radio, uh, and I heard this one. I think it was it was Laura Ingram. Okay. And and she was she she started doing something called the Freaky Fridays, mm-hmm. and she had somebody on talking about UFOs. So I I wrote to the producer an email, and he says, "So send me your book, you know." And so I sent him the book. And then he says, I'm going to have you on. Then he canceled. I was like, ah, figures. Then he calls me out of the blue, like, I don't know. I I don't know. Months went by. I thought he just, whatever. He says, I'm sorry, but, you know, I've parted ways with Laura. I've got, I'm now producing a a news show out of Washington, D.C. called America's Morning News. It's, uh, we partner with the Washington Times. And, um, you know, I'd like to have you on. We'll interview you on on Friday. It's part of he he. It was his idea, you know, not hers. That was part of his production. I'm like, okay, fine. So they had me on once. They had me on twice. They had me on three times. Then they go, um, would you like to do a regular segment with us on Fridays? You could be our ET correspondent. I'm like, I what? <laughs> <laughs> really? I could. You know what? You know. So we did it, and and I did it. I did that for a year, and finally, I just I you know I felt like this is not really going anywhere with for me personally i i wanted to do more and i did i ultimately went off and created my own show but i um i i have the archive of it uh talk radio network this is really top-notch radio mm-hmm. do, you know drive time early morning people were listening to this stuff on fridays and um and it was it, it promoting the heck out of my book and in fact even the second book and the host of the show John McCaslin, his dad, career FBI, he read that book and he, he said it was one of the best things he's ever read. I'm like, because he lives there, you know, and he's like, I've never heard this before. Bob, where'd you get all this information? I'm like, well, you heard it, you know, I mean, I, it's good old investigative journalism. I mean, you know, I, I, <laughs> there's no other way to this, describe uh, it. 
you know, all of these phenomena, the, the, you, the, the flaps that have gone on for the mm. last 60 years, but notoriously yeah. the one over D.C., because that flap over D.C. was really a flap over what I would say is the Northeast Corridor for yeah. you know, probably a decade. Yeah, well, and the other thing was the, the media really only reported it two or three times. It mm. happened almost 80 times that year. People well, were taking photographs and movies. I began digging up archives about what was going on in this area where I live, which is southern central Pennsylvania. I'm only 120 yeah. miles away from Washington, D.C., yeah. which is a, a blink of a nanosecond to a UFO that's traveling on a trajectory. And yeah. realizing that in the time when I was a kid, when I was seeing this stuff, this was actually being documented in newspapers at the time. It that, was. That all got disappeared. It's amazing. Amazing, how UFO, isn't it? Yeah, UFO and coverage And the photographs, they, there was only one. There was only one that survived, and even that was just a fluke. Uh, I, I interviewed Colonel Wendell Stevens before he passed away about this from my first book, and he told me, he said that, you know, it was uh, a, a press photographer took a, that picture of that f armada or whatever you call it, the fleet, as it was passing over the Capitol building. Mm -hmm. He made a copy, gave it to this guy named Augie Roberts, and then, but then the original was confiscated by the uh, the military. Yeah, of course. A, a, as well as all the other movies and stuff, which, again, that was utterly bizarre. How I've you know I've got the largest archive on my website of of DC UFO pictures, movies, and you know everything else you could think of. Uh, so, well, but it people, doesn't make a difference. You know what? We're 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 bumping up against the clock here, and. Um, okay. Let people know about your website, your books, and other things you're involved with, Robert. Sure. It's just unicusmagazine.com, U-N-I-C-U-S magazine.com. It's all there, and there's an email link at the bottom. If you want to send me a message, that would be great. And um, thanks for uh, having me back on, Randy. It's great to have you on. I know you're going to do some traveling, but uh, just <laughs> let me know. That, just to let you know that you're yeah. welcome here anytime. Uh, I'm an email click away because uh, okay. keep us updated. Um, I will. Robert Stanley, uh, Unicus Magazine, and uh, we will be talking more about this in the near future. Uh, this is the Off Planet Radio Live on the Liberty Beacon Media Network. I forgot to mention that tlbtowncrier.com is the website. And uh, we're doing a weekly live show, so when you hear this, you know that you can drop in here on Friday nights and uh, be entertained, amazed, informed, and hopefully enlightened. This is All Playing the Radio Live. I'm Randy Morgan. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Keep looking for it. Good night. Another dimension, a dimension of insight, a dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits, there are no boundaries. This is Planet Radio.